Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this webinar hosted by King Edward VII Hospital. My name is Leslie Regan and I'm a consultant obstetrician and gynaecologist with the Imperial Group based in London. And I'm also a trustee at King Edward VII. This evening, our webinar is entitled Endometriosis Explained. And I'm delighted to be able to introduce you to our star studied panelists. Most importantly, I think what they're going to be able to share with you is endometriosis is a disease that really needs a multidisciplinary team effort if we're going to give the very best care for women. Now, I'd like to just share with you very briefly why I'm interested in that. I'm the immediate past president of the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynaecology. And during my tenure as president, um, I was the author of a report entitled Better for Women, in which we were trying to say to the NHS England and improvement and to the government um, and anybody else in the policy world who would listen, we really need to get things better for women. We need to get their day-to-day -day lives uh, more back into their hands so that they can enjoy them, their working lives, their home lives. And one of the factors that we flagged up in that Better for Women report, and I'll put, put the link in the chat for you all if you'd like to look at it in more detail subsequent to this webinar, is that endometriosis is the problem that blights the lives of many women. And it is really poorly and slowly diagnosed. In fact, what we know, and I'm sure the panelists will refer to this evening, is that women often go to six, seven, possibly more appointments and have multiple investigations before a diagnosis is made, or before, even if there isn't a diagnosis, that they can get help and alleviation for their symptoms. I'm very proud of being a trustee at King Edward VII because I think the ethos there is one of trying to get the very best care for girls and women's health, in fact for men's health too, but I'm not the expert in that field. Um, and what I love particularly about the group and being part of it and also doing some practice there is that the clinicians that I meet um, want to share ideas, thoughts, expertise, and the, and the emphasis is very much on being signposting to the best person to cure that problem as opposed to being territorial and just thinking about what that individual practitioner can contribute. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our panelists very briefly before I hand over to them to give their um, presentations. And firstly, and may I say most importantly, I'd like to introduce you to Carla Cressy, who is an endometriosis sufferer, uh, an awareness campaigner, and has experienced just what I've mentioned, delayed diagnosis and undergone major invasive procedures and hopefully now um, has a multidisciplinary team to care for her. And she's been very active in using social media to raise awareness of the condition and she's going to be talking about her experiences. We're then going to pass on to three uh, clinicians. Firstly, Alfred Kuckner, who is a consultant gynaecologist at King Edward VII and also at University College Hospital London. And he has a great interest in minimal access surgery, laparoscopic approaches and its application to endometriosis and many other gynecological problems, which in fact may present with symptoms similar to endometriosis, both fibroids, urogynecology symptoms, and also to an extent pediatric and adolescent gynecology. And I think what Ralph will probably be telling you, although I don't want to take the words out of his mouth, is how important it is to think about laparoscopic or invasive surgery in the contact of that woman's symptoms and how his work is complemented by others who have experience in the other multidisciplinary treatments that are applicable to endometriosis. And then I'm going to ask my colleague, Joel Naftalin, who's also a gynecologist at UCL, and his main area of expertise is in early pregnancy and gynecological ultrasound and emergency gynecology, complex benign surgery. All of these particular areas the endometriosis sufferer can present to. And I think what he's going to be sharing with us is how important it is to try and get the diagnosis and how clever, clever sophisticated image can really help us all get to the root cause without wasting too many of those precious visits and too many months or years of that woman's life. And then I'm going to turn to my colleague, Michael Dooley, who now is based um, in the South. Um, and he's um, 
been an NHS consultant in gynaecology for some time, trained in London, and our paths have met on many occasions in the past. And he's also very interested in providing an integrated patient-centered approach to women's health and trying to find ways of coping specifically with their fertility problems. And of course, as many of you will know who are watching this webinar, um, endometriosis can be a cause of subfertility and infertility and early pregnancy complications. So I think it's much more important that I stop there and turn over to our expert panelists and then at the end of their short presentations, I'm going to be guiding us all through some of the questions. Thank you for um, contributing those questions before this webinar started. And if you have any additional ones, I think you'll be able to either include them in the Q&A box or in the chat uh, box of your, your Zoom platform. So without further ado, Carla, you're very, very welcome. Thank you so much for giving us your time and allowing us, if you like, a window into the troubles and tribulations that you've suffered and sharing them with us because the patient experience really has to be first front and center to all we do as clinicians trying to look after women. So we're really, really grateful to you for coming this evening. The platform is yours since I can't say the floor or the stage is yours just at this moment in time. Carla, over to you. Thank you, Leslie. And hi, everybody. Um, so I'm Carla, I'm 29. Um, and I started experiencing symptoms of endometriosis when I was 13. Um, just to begin with, my periods are very irregular, incredibly painful. Um, so my mum took me to see a gynaecologist when I was 14, but they just kind of done an ultrasound scan, an internal exam, but nothing was found. Um, so then I was put on a pill and it didn't help. Um, I then, by the time I was 17, I had trialed seven different hormone pills, none of which made any difference whatsoever. I would bleed every 12 to 14 days and the pain, I would just be curled up in a ball. I would be fainting in school and I also had terrible migraines as well with the bleeding, um, which turned out to be aura migraines. So I'd often have all this pain and be fainting, just constantly fainting. Um, so anyway, as I kind of got into my early 20s, that's when things really seemed to progress. Um, at this stage, I was, I actually lost my job because I was just passing out all the time. I was in pain all the time. Um, and I would also have these large cysts um, that, I would kind of go to the doctors about and have scans, but they would just say, oh, they'll go away on their own. Um, so by the time I reached 21, which was eight years ago now, I started to experience a lot of bowel symptoms. Um, at first they told me it was IBS, but I knew it wasn't because I didn't have the typical IBS symptoms. Um, so it got to a stage where um, my bowel symptoms were almost as awful as my kind of period related symptoms to the point where I couldn't pass a bowel movement. Um, and I would often be taken to hospital, um, because of this, so, cause I would be vomiting, um, and the pain would just be so excruciating. And I was then wrongly diagnosed with, um, sleepy bowel syndrome. Um, so, I mean, during this time, I would still kind of go back and forward to the doctor about my periods. Um, nothing was ever, it just wasn't, I mean, I would, I would be questioned, you know, are you sure you've been bleeding for this amount of days? And it was just kind of, I would just get passed, passed off. They were just, they wasn't really interested. <laughs> um, so I gave up going to the doctors for a little while and kind of just lived with the pain and tried to just deal with it as much as I could until the point where I couldn't physically do it anymore. Um, I couldn't, I could, there were days I couldn't move. I would be screaming in agony and I would be so poorly. I would be vomiting. And at this point, I think I was about 23 years old and I was just in the hospital every few days. I would be rushed in. I would be taken in by ambulance. My family would take me. Um, again, they would say it's probably IBS or it's pelvic inflammatory disease. Not, nobody ever mentioned endometriosis. Um, I was also in a 
quite a serious relationship at this point and I started to experience kind of the pain and bleeding with uh, intercourse so then I went back to my doctor and I said you know I'm I'm you know this isn't this isn't right something's wrong um but they kind of brushed it off and then I, I remember I was googling my symptoms which I, I shouldn't have done um <laughs> and cervical cancer came up with the irregular bleeding and the bleeding and pain with intercourse so I went back to my doctors and I was I was 23 and I asked them you know can I have a smear test um because something's not right you know I'm in agony all the time I'm bleeding all the time I'm bleeding during and after intercourse I don't even want to have intercourse because I'm it's just so painful and my my GP at the time that he actually agreed that I should have a smear test um but he explained that because of my age and being too young that they would likely refuse it so we tried three times and all three times they refused to to test me so I just kind of carried on think just I just didn't know what to do I just just doing what I can and yeah it was, it was uh, quite a stressful time that was um but anyway as time went on just still worse I lost my job because I was just always being found unconscious <laughs> um and then fast forward two years so I had two years of constant being taken to hospital collapsing in hospital car parts and all these bowel symptoms um when I was 25 during one of my hospital visits one of the doctors came around and he mentioned endometriosis and I'd never heard of it I didn't have any idea what it was um my mum had never heard of it I had three sisters nobody had ever heard of it um so I said okay and they said um we'll have to do a, a laparoscopy and just see see what's going on so I had a laparoscopy and they diagnosed with stage two they said that my ovaries were stuck together I had kissing ovaries and they also said that I had they saw some endometriosis on my bowel but um it shouldn't it shouldn't cause me any problems and they gave me the coil and kind of sent me on my way and they didn't tell me anything about it so I was I looked on Google and there wasn't much about it then I mean this was nearly five years ago now so a lot's changed thank, thank god but um yeah so I just went away thinking oh it, it's that's it it's gone and things will get better now um a couple of weeks after my surgery I was back bleeding in pain my bowel symptoms again they were just they were back like they never left um so I kept going back and forward to my GP and say you know something's not right I'm still in you know still in agony again nothing's kind of changed and they just I was just kind of advised to keep going and wait for the coil to settle down and hopefully things will work out and and settle um and then five months after I, I was at a friend's house and I collapsed in pain. Um, it was awful. And I was taken by ambulance to hospital and they sent me away telling me it was gastroenteritis. Um, the next morning, I kind of hobbled around to my GP surgery with my mum and they sent me straight to the hospital and said, oh, we think you've got appendicitis. So I got rushed to hospital and they took me straight down to the theatre and removed my appendix. Um, so whilst I was in the hospital bed recovering, I was getting worse and I was still vomiting. I, at this point, I couldn't stop vomiting. So they'd put all the tubes up and down into my stomach and they were pumping everything and oh, it was horrible. But um, yeah, so the, the lab results come back and said that my appendix was still intact, but there was endometriosis kind of all over it. So I'm laying in this hospital bed and my stomach just extended. I looked like I was pregnant. And I was just really unwell. My infection levels were through the roof. And they rushed me back into surgery. And this time they kind of cut me from hip to hip. And they said, well, they explained that it, it looked like someone had poured, had opened my abdomen and poured cement into my pelvis. And all my, my whole entire kind of pelvis was just full of scar tissue. Um, I had endometriomas, the blood filled cyst that burst um, and they drained a lot of blood. And that was when I got my diagnosis of um, frozen pelvis and kind of severe endometriosis. 
So from then I kind of recovered in the hospital. I was in there for a good few weeks. Um, and then I was sent to a specialist center, which I never even knew existed at this point. So I just wish that I found out about these centers sooner. And I, I went there and I had all these different scans and MRIs and they were picking all these things up on these tests, which I'd had tests prior, six months prior to that, and nobody had picked anything up. And they, they said, you know, you've got quite severe stages of endometriosis. We're going to have to go inside and take a look around and kind of plan this operation. Um, and at this point, I couldn't physically have a bowel movement. I was having to have all stool softeners and things. I wasn't able to eat. I was incredibly underweight. I was so poorly. And so they went inside and, and they just said, yeah, it's not, it's not good. Um, I had deep endometriosis in my bowel. I had it in my bladder, just completely everywhere. Um, my bowel had fused, well, my, my uterus had fused to my bowel and I didn't have adenomyosis, um, but what had happened was the endometriosis had actually grown through the back of my uterus. So that's when I was kind of told in regards to fertility, um, the chances of me carrying um, kind of a pregnancy to full term were very slim and I was quite high risk of um, miscarriage, but also my fallopian tubes were completely ruined. Um, so I, at this point as well, I also had only had one kind of working ovary. The other one was twisted and buried, um, which they couldn't actually find during that exploratory um, surgery. So I went away and I kind of was trying to think, you know, what, what do I do? And it was quite hard because I just thought all the years of going back and forward to the doctors, I must have been there every period I had because it was just so excruciating that nobody knowing now that actually they're all the most common signs of endometriosis and nobody picked it up. And we moved as well, kind of growing up. So I had various different GPs and nurses and doctors that I saw and different hospitals I just yeah it was quite um difficult to hear that um but moving on I decided to freeze my eggs and at this point the surgery was we were planning to remove one ovary and both my fallopian tubes um sorry I've kind of jumped forward a bit there um we later found out the kind of extent that on my uterus a little bit later so I'll just go back a little bit um so I went and froze my eggs which was really difficult uh I just my stomach just ballooned and I was in agony um we managed to get four um eggs frozen so it wasn't great um but again it's it's something and when I went back to have more MRI scans I said to my well when I went back to see my um, specialist I said you know my symptoms they're worse my pain's a lot worse I, I think something maybe progressed so we, we carried out some more scans some MRIs and things and it had progressed so I, I think that treatment I don't think it helped very much it seemed to really aggravate my symptoms um and then at this stage that's when I found out it's 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 too far gone now um so I had surgery last October and I had to have kind of everything removed um all my reproductive organs it actually even even in like the cervix all my healthy tissue was just replaced with this rough hard painful inflamed tissue so it just kind of spread all across my pelvis um it also invaded my bowel so I had to have some of my bowel cut away so I now have a temporary stoma and my bladder was also kind of pulled out of place. Um, so that would explain that, well, the bladder symptoms, I didn't actually realize how bad they were probably until about six months before this surgery because I was constantly on the hormone treatments. Um, but when I come off the treatments to kind of prepare for surgery, that's when I started to notice, okay, something's not right with my bladder. It felt like I had constant cystitis and it, I just, I couldn't hold um my urine for longer than a few minutes without my stomach kind of flaring up and having pain um so yeah I didn't actually realize how it had affected my bladder until I come off the hormone treatments but my pelvic and bowel symptoms were all time around um so yeah I just had that surgery now and um 
I'm in menopause, um, which has actually been okay so far. Um, I did have a lot of experience with the medical menopause and compared to that, I'm, I feel a lot better in that in the surgical menopause. So uh, hopefully that will kind of keep going the way that's going. But um, yeah, so I'm just kind of recovering and getting back to good health. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carla. That must be very painful, uh, pardon the pun, to be exposed yeah. to having to revisit and we appreciate you doing so and so clearly and concisely for us. Thank you. You've raised many questions and there will be many questions, I think, about uh, following your presentation. One of the things that um, I wanted you to comment on, if you will, is um, what your experiences were attending a center that, that, that had expertise in this and, and you know and what you met at the beginning of your journey if you like to trying to find a diagnosis yeah so when I kind of found out about the center I mean I went from I'd never heard of it none of my family knew what it was my friends and I was a beautician so I had a lot of girlfriends around me that I would see on a daily basis and nobody knew what it was so when I went to the center it's just like a I just felt like I could breathe I just I, you know I'd, I'd once I kind of got that diagnosis from the surgery in the beginning which wasn't great um even then they couldn't really tell me much about it they didn't tell me anything they didn't kind of give me any information so getting getting to that center I just I was just so relieved and the specialist, I had a whole multidisciplinary team. There were nurses, there were colorectal, there was urology, there were gynecology, and they were all just so supportive. And I just, I, it, I was emotional because I just thought I'd been through this for such a long time, not knowing and you know, losing my job, but we didn't know what was wrong. So it was, I, I was, it was, the, it was just a mess for year, many years. It was just a mess and. You just, I just felt like finally I can sit down with this doctor, tell him all my symptoms, and they believe me. That they know that they understand and they've heard it before. Because and they, 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 it's they're explaining why I'm getting those symptoms or and and you know what we can do about it. But for years, I, you know, I, I remember a, one female doctor saying to me, you know, are you sure you've been bleeding for 60, 60 days, you know, and just questioning me when I've got a diary in front of me and I'm and so anemic, I'm on iron, you know, and I just think like it's, it was just so difficult, but it was a huge relief to find out about the centres and just to be in that care. I think you've put that really well. It's the difference between solitary and on your own and feeling yeah. Team and that's what I hope we'll be able to demonstrate that the King Edward the Seventh team are really multidisciplinary and wanting to put you at the center of care, uh, not not themselves or, or their particular special uh, special skill set. Thank you. There are lots of comments in the chat from people attendees telling us that they are part of your support group on Facebook um, and how much you've helped them in sharing your journey. Um, and lots of people saying, yes, it's got to get better for women. I couldn't agree more. And that's why we call that RCOG report exactly that, better for women. Um, I would argue when you get it better for women, everybody else benefits as well. But that's me on a rant of my own. I'm going to pass over because time is pressing. And I'm going to move over now to Alfred Kuttner. Alfred, I've already introduced you, but please, the platform is yours. Thank you very much, Leslie. And thank you, Carla, for sharing your story. And I think you've brought out very many important points. You've brought out the importance of the delay diagnosis, the importance of good investigations, and the importance of bringing a whole team together. And just like you said, you felt alone before you went there. It's really important within a team that the doctor doesn't feel alone either. So the doctor works within a team of people with everyone bringing their own expertise. So what is endometriosis? Well, endometriosis is lining of the womb outside the womb. So when the woman has a period on the outside, there's a period on the inside. And this leads to collections, it leads to cysts, and it leads to organs sticking together. So typically, the woman will complain of painful periods. And then when things stick together, you'll go on to develop pain on intercourse, and pain with the bowels, and pain with the bladder, and all the symptoms you have been describing as the condition will progress. And it may also result in fertility issues. And you've highlighted that as well, and the importance of preserving eggs. And Michael will be talking on um, the fertility aspects later on. We don't really know what causes it. There are several theories behind it. One is that 
the period blood goes backwards to the tubes and into the pelvis. And that's probably one theory, which is why most endometriosis in the pelvis. But we also see endometriosis in distant sites. And now there's become a realization that some women get diaphragmatic endometriosis and some women can get thoracic endometriosis. And that's probably because it spreads through the vascular system and cells can change over time. And there's been a big drive on realizing that this is another entity that can exist and that we must start to work together with the other colleagues in areas that we're not used to working in. But in addition to this, there's probably some form of genetic predisposition and environmental factors. So it's a multitude of things coming together which results in the development of endometriosis. And it's not rare, it's very common, and it's suggested there's about one and a half million women in the UK with endometriosis. And several years ago, I helped set up a centre in Cornwall, and we looked at what you'd expect to see in Cornwall, which is a half million population. And it's quite easy to see whether the calculators are roughly right or wrong, because people in Cornwall like to be treated in Cornwall, so they don't tend to move away very much. And we calculated you'd expect to see between five and 20,000 women Per year with endometriosis but we were setting up an endometriosis center for the more severe disease like you've explained and we'd expect to see about 50 new cases with severe disease per year and this is actually what we found so having severe disease is quite common and you'd expect to see it in about 50 women per half million population but more less severe disease is also very common and it's important when women have symptoms that they go through a pathway. So we don't overtreat, but we don't undertreat. We need to make a diagnosis or we need to exclude a diagnosis because other things can look like endometriosis when they're not, but we mustn't not be diagnosing endometriosis when it's there either. And this is where good diagnostics come in. And a trial of medical treatment is always good, but it mustn't go on and on and on as you've described. A short trial with resolution helps, but if a short trial without resolution, then it's really important to move on to the next stage. And laparoscopy, as we know, is the only way to definitely make the diagnosis. But unfortunately, laparoscopy being an operation does have a risk of complications. And so this is why good diagnostics help us key which women will benefit from a laparoscopy and which women won't benefit from a laparoscopy and guide patients through the best pathway for them. So I'm going to stop there and I'm going to allow us to move on to Joel to discuss the diagnostic aspects. Thank you, Alfred. And Joel, would you like to go on uh, now? And then there's lots of questions, but I think it'd be great to pose them to you all uh, rather than just picking them out one by one. So, Joel, on to the diagnostic aspects, please. Sure. So, uh, first of all, thanks for inviting me to talk. Uh, thanks to Leslie and Alfred for the introduction. And again, thanks to Carla for sharing your journey. Um, if I can just start by introducing myself uh, just to explain I have a research interest in the ultrasound diagnosis of endometriosis and adenomyosis and as been said I perform ultrasounds for endometriosis at the Guinea Ultrasound Centre UCH and, and King Edwards. I'm, I'm going to start off by talking about the problems with poor quality ultrasound before talking about the importance of high quality ultrasound. Um, unfortunately Carla's story which may well mirror the experience of many of you is, is, is a depressing reminder of the harm that poor quality ultrasound does to women with endometriosis. Like thousands of women in this country I'm sure large numbers of you have gone through the frustration of knowing there's something wrong but undergoing a substandard ultrasound that says the opposite and this can be devastating for women given the number of barriers they may already have pushed through before getting a scan again as illustrated so well by Carla. This leads to the paradoxical situation I frequently see, whereby women, because of the journey they've been through, are relieved and sometimes even delighted to finally receive a diagnosis of what we know is a terrible chronic condition. So if I can just talk briefly about why poor quality ultrasound is, is a problem. First of all, it, 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 with kind of poor quality standard ultrasound, the only endometriosis that can be seen is, is endometriosis of the ovaries. <clears throat> Now, given that just over 75% of women with significant endometriosis in one of our publications don't have endometriosis cysts of the ovaries, this means that over three quarters of the women with significant endometriosis who undergo this level of ultrasound will be incorrectly told that they don't have endometriosis. Other problems with poor quality ultrasound, you have unnecessary operations for severe endometriosis, because they're performed by inadequately trained surgeons, because even though the scan, because 
um, even though the, the, um, the scan failed to determine the severity of endometriosis, they still went ahead with it. And then it was too severe for them to operate outside of their expertise. And I kind of, I did what I could, but now you need to go to an endometriosis center. Um, had the diagnostics beforehand been of a better quality, you could have missed that step. There's also the potential for unnecessary operations for no endometriosis, because, because even though the scan says there's no endometriosis, gynecologists will still do the operation because they know that they can't always trust the scans. So even though this, the scan says there's nothing there, from their experience of these poor quality scans, they know that often there is significant uh, endometriosis. So what can high quality ultrasound do? Well, often um, there's a discussion about MRI versus ultrasound. Ultrasound is much more wide, is much more widely available. It tends to be the first line investigation for women presenting with pain. And high quality ultrasound can be equivalent to MRI, which tends to be a test that's done later on. And it's more expensive and much less widely available. Um, but it's only high quality ultrasound that's equivalent to MRI. High quality ultrasound can diagnose deep infiltrating endometriosis. That's endometriosis involving the, the bowel, the bladder, um, but it can also exclude deep infiltrating endometriosis as well. And I don't, many of you may have heard or may not have heard, but th that you, can, you can still have superficial endometriosis. And it was always said that you can't see superficial endometriosis, even on expert high quality scans, but actually with recent advances, we can see some superficial endometriosis, although we can't completely exclude it. Other advantages of high quality ultrasound, you can see other things as well as the amount, the extent of the endometriosis. Is the endometriosis causing scarring? Is there scarring from other surgery? Might that scarring be a cause of pain? And of course the surgeon wants to know how much scarring is because that determines the complexity of the surgery that they're going to be performing if you're going to end up having surgery. It allows them to triage. So does the level of endometriosis we can see on scan need a minimal access expert? Actually, is it even more significant than that and you need an endometriosis surgical expert, someone like Alfred, or even two endometriosis experts? Can the operation be done all in one? Or actually, again, is it so complex that it needs a two-stage operation? Do you need a bowel surgeon present? Do you need a urologist present because it's potentially involving the ureters, which are the tubes that bring urine from the kidney down to the bladder, or even affecting the kidney, which is uh, another major reason why you have to have surgery. The other last thing I'll just say is that there are other problems that aren't endometriosis, that your endometriosis surgeon may well want to know about and you may well want to know about. One of those is a condition called adenomyosis which can sort of be considered to be endometriosis of the womb. It's the, it's the tissue that normally lines the cavity of the womb being in the wrong place in the muscle layer of the womb and that can also be a cause of heavy painful periods and will determine other treatment options as well as um, surgery that you might undergo. But also, and this hopefully links into Mike's talk, is that also it can help and high quality ultrasound gives valuable information for to, to help you with the fertility aspect of what endometriosis, um, how it affects endometriosis as well. So um, I, that's me done. So I'll hand over to Mike, I think, or back to Leslie, I guess. Lovely. No, thank you, Joel. That's really, really helpful. And um, either wittingly or unwittingly, you've answered at least six questions in the chat and the Q&A's about what is um, adenomyosis and what, how does it relate to endometriosis? So thank you for that. So I'm going to pass over to Michael before we go on to the other questions. So please, panelists, have a look at the questions in the Q and A because I'll use those uh, and come to you. And please chip in when after Michael's presentation, uh, if you want to add something or raise your hand, whichever would be the easiest. Michael, over to you. Thank you very much, Leslie. And and again, I must thank Carla for being so open frank and informative, and I think you are going to help a lot of other people in the future. And uh, I'm a consultant gynaecologist, and I run the fertility unit at King Edward VII Hospital, and infertility, like endometriosis, needs a, a big team approach, and it's, it's a great privilege to be part of the, the endometriosis team at King Edward. I mean, if we, if we just look and go back, is infertility is a big problem. One in six couples have it, greater than 3.2 million people at any one time in this country have it. So you know, 1.5 million people with endometriosis, so a lot of people are affected. And, and obviously with infertility, it's, it's, it's male and, and the female, but we're concentrating on the female here. And I think one's got to stand right back in, in managing anybody with infertility. And we've not only got to look at the, the medical issues, but also the emotional issues, the ethical issues, often legal issues involved, and, and sadly, financial issues. But if we move on now to, to where endometriosis plays a role is, 
yes, endometriosis can cause infertility, but not everybody with endometriosis has infertility. And I think that's important. It's a very important diagnosis to make. And, and with um, Jan's team and, 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 we can, and, and good scans, we can get that information and it's important to put it into the picture. But a lot of people with endometriosis um, do not have infertility. But equally, and, 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 and it was interesting that we were talking that sometimes people do laparoscopies and don't find endometriosis. Going back to, uh, dare I say, in the sort of late eighties, when instead of doing ultrasound, we used to do laparoscopies for people with to do IVF. So they'd been stimulated with the drugs for IVF and we did a laparoscopy. And these were patients who had been diagnosed as not having infertility, but we had stimulated them and, and in order to, to grow their eggs for, endometri for, 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 for the IVF, we sometimes, and not infrequently, found endometriosis. And it's a bit like that sometimes weeds on the, the lawn don't appear until you feed them. So I think a lot of people do have endometriosis that is not easy to diagnose. I, it's a great privilege in my, in my past that I was taught by Patrick Steptoe, who did the first IVF. And he always said that, Fertility is a story of transport, and it is. It's as simple as that. You need good eggs to meet good sperm, and the sperm needs to move up the fallopian tube to meet the egg that's moved down the fallopian tube to create an embryo that moves. It's all about transport. Endometriosis can really upset the transport. And I think, as Carla said, that initially, just being so unwell, fainting every time you have a period, it's going to upset creating relationships and upset you know, your libido and every other area like that. So just the general awful feelings of endometriosis can cause problems. Then with pain with intercourse, it can prevent the, well, one prevent intercourse and prevent the sperm meeting the egg. And then eventually it can cause damage to the tubes and dysfunction of the tubes and also upset the ovary and reduced egg reserve and the eggs not coming out. So endometriosis can affect the whole of the transport from the sperm moving up in to meet the egg, the egg coming down, etc. But what do we do with infertility? And I think this is where I've learned so much by being part of this team, that it is very much a team approach because you know, major management of endometriosis may have a negative effect on fertility and major treatment with infertility have a negative effect on endometriosis. And that's why we've got to balance the treatment of the infertility with the treatment of the endometriosis. And yes, we need a good diagnostic test, which may also not include the, the scan and the detailed high resolution scan, but a tube test. And then investigate and get a real basic understanding. Um, uh, and, in, but, and don't forget to investigate the male and to see whether ovulation is occurring. And then also address lifestyle, diet, exercise, stress management, sleep, etc. is terribly important. So we build up the whole picture. And then what do we can we then do? And that's where one's got to look as what is the problem and where is the solution? And it may need surgery and it may need surgery before or after treatment. And that's what we've got to then discuss. Sometimes it's a difficulty with intercourse, one may consider intrauterine insemination. And exactly then, as Carla said, that by giving the treatment for um, fertility treatment, by going for egg freezing, um, that stimulated the endometriosis and made the pain worse. And also then, if you haven't got a, a, a children, um, one's got to begin to think about egg freezing, look at what is the availability of that, Remembering, however, egg freezing is still very early in this country. I think there's only been about 2000 babies born by egg freezing in this country. So I think if you've got a diagnosis of endometriosis, it's important at an early stage to talk to a fertility expert to see what can be done if you're not trying to get pregnant to help obtain and maintain your peak fertility. Two, do you need to think about egg freezing before surgery? Three, if not, do you, are you beginning to think about a child? And I think also when you're in my fertility treatment, I think we're thinking about a family rather than a child. 
do you need to move on at assisted conception? Do you need to do on to collect eggs, collect embryos, and then create embryos and then go for surgery? So it's a team approach talking to the, the surgeons, talking to the fertility experts. So in summary, I think the most important advice I could do is seek help early. Um, if in doubt, give a shout. But it is, as Carla said, a very, very, uh, or can be a very rocky journey. And I hope if we can create a good team approach, it is the way forward um, that we can make that journey, although it may be rough, we can help uh, guide you and, and help you through that journey as a team all together. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. That's really helpful. So um, we're going to go on to some questions now. And I think to get the ball rolling, what I'll propose is that I ask our panelists in turn. I've already asked Carla a couple of things, but I'll come back to her and give her the last word at the end. But I'm going to start by asking Alfred if I could ask you to come in with a few questions, several here. Um, lots of people asking, how can you get referred for specialist treatment like that described at King Edward VII uh, on the NHS? You mentioned um, the Southwest and, and various other speakers have mentioned other centres. Where's the best place for our, uh, our um, webinar audience to go to if they want to find information apart from the King Edward VII website? Well, patients like Carla who have spoken out and the Endometriosis UK have raised awareness and the British Society of Gynae Endoscopy and the Royal College of Bobs and Gynae helped develop these centres and helped encourage the development of a nice guidance. So we now have a pathway and along the pathway there are endometriosis centres and the centres are for the management of women who have severe disease. And they consist of a bowel surgeon, a urologist and a gynaecologist and the person we haven't talked about yet, the pain management expert as well, in conjunction with appropriate fertility advice, because that will depend, obviously, on the patient's position in her life. And the BSG has accredited centres and that means there is an adequate amount of throughput so your surgical expertise are appropriate and you work with a familiar team because we all know if we work with the same people we do better so we operate within the same teams and so it's not just calling a surgeon if there's a problem with the bowel it's planning the patient's care and helping the patient understand the proposed treatments and working with the diagnostic team to help plan what's going to be done. And you can go to the BSG website and on it, you can go to the endometriosis centres and it lists the centres around the UK. And there are 60 centres plus now. So there are quite a lot of centres have developed. And this has been a great journey for both the college and the BSG working together to help develop these centres. And the NHS in England commissions specialist commissioning. So when they buy healthcare, NHS England, they also buy specialised healthcare and they have set out the standards that is to be expected by a hospital that is delivering the care for women with severe endometriosis. So a combination of the NICE guidance, NHS England, the college and the BSG has allowed these centres to flourish and you can find them through the BSG website. So if you go to British Society for Gynaecological Endoscopy and you go on there and you tick accredited centres, you will see the number of centres that exist. Don't be put off by the small amount of surgery that was done in the last year, because obviously with COVID, the numbers are very small this year. But all these groups of people have worked together, they've done adequate numbers and they have adequate experience to be able to help guide a woman through her journey when she has severe endometriosis. Lovely. So thank you, Alfred. So to our audience, the British Society for Gynaecological Endoscopy, the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists and the NICE website as well. Alfred, can I give you a bit of homework when we go on to somebody else to answer questions and ask you if you just put the, the website addresses into the Q&A session for our panellists at, at your leisure in a moment. I've got another question for you, if I may, though. One of our, several of our panellists, oh, several, no, sorry, several of our audience have asked to, for a, a simple dis, um, differentiation between fibroids and endometriosis. Yeah, so endometriosis is not part of the womb by definition. It's outside the womb. Adenomyosis that Joel touched on is within the wall of the uterus, and this causes pain with periods, whereas fibroids is a 
the muscle of the womb. And so that's not causing painful periods commonly, that causes heavy periods and abdominal masses. And so it's different symptoms. And scans are very good at differentiating between fibroids and adenomyosis. Whereas of course endometriosis is very different because by definition, it must be outside the womb. Lovely, thank you. So Alfred, I'll come back to you shortly if we have time. And just to reassure our audience that there are literally dozens and dozens of questions and those that we can't get through tonight, we will aim to respond to. And um, Barney, who's been um, hosting our, our King Edward VII webinar, will be putting a special email address to everyone who's registered as a participant uh, to, to, to be able to access any other answers that you want to. I'm going to move on to Joel, if I may. And there have been several questions about whether MRI is useful if an ultrasound diagnosis is negative or even vice versa. So I wondered if you'd like to specifically address that, Joel. Um, so I, I think that um, <clears throat> no test is perfect, but if an ultrasound has shown that there is no deep infiltrating endometriosis and an MRI also suggests that there is no deep infiltrating endometriosis, then I think it's very unlikely that you're going to find deep infiltrating endometriosis there. Um, that's useful. Women may still say, look, I, I want the 100% certainty of a laparoscopy, but that, lap la that laparoscopy, I reference triaging and getting the right people to do surgery. Um, as long as the patient is aware that there's a, 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 a low risk of their, or a very a high risk of their not being significant endometriosis, but uh, alongside that, it also means that someone who's highly trained uh, surgical expert like Alfred doesn't need to be doing that operation um, because any endometriosis that you might find is likely to be superficial and relatively easily treated. So a, a minimal access expert, but not necessarily someone so highly trained for endometriosis doesn't need to be there, a bowel surgeon doesn't need to be there. And so it's just easier to plan the surgery. So <clears throat> surgery may still have a role, but really, if, if, if both tests have been negative, then you're unlikely to find significant disease. Thank you, Joel. And another question, and I'm lumping actually now several questions together. There have been some queries about the more unusual um, presentations, um, but particularly troublesome in terms of diagnosis and treatment of lymphedema, sciatic pain and pneumothoraces. And the question is, is... Um, is this always going to depend on a laparoscopic or, if you like, an invasive procedure to identify these unusual um, or less common presentations, or will an MRI pick that up? Um, I might, if it's okay, defer, I, that's not a question that I would necessarily, certainly in terms of pneumothoraces, that's, you know, scanning the chest, that's not something that um, we would do if, if, if when we're taking a history of a patient who's not known to have endometriosis, they describe cyclical shoulder tip pain or thoracic pain, then uh, we would actually speak to Alfred and say, look, you know, we want to rule out thoracic endometriosis or sciatic endometriosis, what would you recommend? Mm -hmm. So I, I think I'd probably defer to Alfred on that question if it's okay. Okay, Alfred, a yes, one-liner? So it, it's, very, it's very important um, when the diagnostic laparoscopy is done to go through a system of assessing the whole of the pelvis and the abdomen. So we look at the uterus, we look in front of the uterus, we look behind the uterus, we lift the ovaries up, we look at the ovaries, we look at the appendix and we look at the diaphragm. So we turn the telescope round and we look at the top of the tummy and we look at the diaphragm. And then we can see dots which are suggestive of endometriosis, sometimes quite active areas of endometriosis. Removing diaphragmatic endometriosis would have to be done in conjunction with an upper gut surgeon or a thoracic surgeon because it's quite a hazardous operation. And we need to weigh up with the person what are the risks and the benefits of the different choices. But an MRI will be able to look at the thickness and whether it's invading through the diaphragm. To look at the chest, this is a new evolving area that none of us are very experienced about. And the BSG is going to start to look at this and look at working with thoracic surgeons to see whether this undiagnosed area is an entity and where the centres should be. But probably as we develop thoracic centres for endometriosis, there will probably only be two in the country. It's a less common condition. But yet again, that shows specialist centres and this would be super specialist centres. So the more rare a condition, the more you need to bring experts together but you also need to make sure that you don't keep replicating it 
because you have to have an adequate workload to understand and recognize what you're treating. Thank you. I mean, there's loads and loads more questions coming in and we will try and respond to as many as we can by email. There's one that I thought I could answer, which was what was it? Was it the quality of the ultrasound based on the equipment or the user? And my response would be, well, and you can shout me down if you like, Joel, but I suppose if you've got really lousy equipment, it's unlikely you're going to see uh, sophisticated stuff, but really it's all in the eye of the beholder. So you can have very sophisticated equipment and if the user isn't experienced, you're not going to pick up all the nuances. And that's why you need a really specialist team like that. It's a fair comment, Joel? Yeah, I, I would absolutely mirror that. When, when I talk, I mean, I appreciate actually now that the question's being asked that it's not necessarily clear from the way I talk. But when I talk about high quality ultrasound, the majority of it is the person, the training of the person who's doing it. There is no, there's no question that as technology improves, we are now better able to pick up, for example, I was talking about the advances in diagnosing superficial endometriosis, adenomyosis, we're much more comfortable in diagnosing with technological advances, but you are much better having an expert using uh, slightly outdated equipment than you are having an, you know, someone who isn't trained in endometriosis scanning using top of the range equipment. Yeah, so you have to go to the really, the really experienced user primarily is the key. So Michael, lots of questions about fertility. We won't be able to answer them all. And to some of the audience um, who've given us very detailed examples, I think what we'll try and do is answer you in more detail by email and give you the necessary links to us. But there are a lot of questions about does stage four, um, a diagnosis of stage four endometriosis mean I can't have children? And also what are the risks of uh, all and the benefits to fertility when removing endometriotic tissues from ovaries? Do you want to start with a, a potpourri there? I think first of all, I, I'd never say you can never have children. Um, and again, we've all done sterilization on women who've had and completed their family who have had endometriosis and often may not have known about it. So I think one must never ever say you cannot have children, but it only goes back to what this whole uh, webinar is about. It's a team approach. If somebody has stage four endometriosis, um, they may come to me or they may come to uh, Alfred having diagnosed um, by Jal. And, and then we've got to discuss what is their plans? What are their thoughts about an immediate pregnancy, long-term pregnancy, um, and, and we then got to weigh up the benefits about doing surgery against the risks of doing surgery and the benefits of thinking about egg preservation to do IVF. And, and sometimes it can be a two-stage um, process that we may begin to create the eggs, create the embryos, and then freeze those and think about surgery. So that's where it really is a multidisciplinary team approach um, with the patient, the center, to ask what do they want with regards to their fertility and the fertility compared to the symptoms, as Khan expressed, you know, that, 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 you know, that if they're life changing symptoms, one has to balance that all up. So it's not an easy decision. And, and I think you're right, though, we've got to have an individualized approach, and it's definitely not one size fits all. So the other thing I wanted to ask, and I'm, I mean, I'm paraphrasing a couple of questions here, is that I think sort of trends in management surgically have gone through 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 sort of phases, haven't they? There was a time when you tried to strip um, endometriotic cysts away, and then there was the view that you, that was going to strip away too many primordial follicles and have an adverse effect. W what's the zeitgeist at the moment? What would you say is the best well, way? I think again, that's why I always enjoy with Alf and I working together, and some you know we we regularly pre-pandemic used to operate together, and we can balance that risk. Mm -hmm. And I think you know any surgery has a risk and that's why we've got to first of all assess the egg reserve before surgery um but i think and alfred will, will i think uh, support this and interest to hear what else is it's better to not to be using the diathermy which can can damage the ovary and if necessary strip it out and and then surgically use sutures to to correct for hemostasis etc rather than use electro diathermy okay agree alfred yeah yes <laughs> <laughs> we like to answers. <laughs> Look, I mean, I can't do justice to all these questions, but I promise you, audience, we will do our very best to answer all the individual queries. But there are a couple of things that I would like our panelists to to give some short, snappy answers to, if they can. And of course, this is the the hundred million dollar question: What causes endometriosis? And another question that's been repeated four or five times here in the chat and the Q and A is: What impact do gluten and dairy 
have on the um, the disease process. So um, that's a sort of a start of the 10. Any of you can chip in now, please, if you've got thoughts on that. Causes of endometriosis, snappy answers, please. And do gluten or do, does diet have an impact uh, on the disease? Shall okay. I start? Yeah, we, we, we don't know the causes. I, I said in my brief, run through, which was very brief, the three theories behind it. And we know each of those theories will be correct in some women and not in others. So they probably all do hold true and they all don't hold true depending on the person. And there is a predisposition and that's why there's a genetic aspect and there is an environmental factors that come into it as well. And as far as diet goes, well, of course, endometriosis responds to hormones. So diet isn't going to cure endometriosis, but it will help with the symptoms. Pain relief will help with symptoms. So if you have endometriosis involving, involving your bowel, your bowel will not be functioning well. If you improve the diet, then the bowel will function better. But as it's hormonally dependent, diet isn't going to treat it, but it is going to treat the symptoms. So it is still an important aspect of the care. Lovely, thank you. Anybody want to add anything else specific? Thank you. Um, also a question here about uh, what happens to symptoms at the time of the menopause? Alfred, I think that's you okay. again. Yeah, um, well, endometriosis largely responds to cyclical hormones. So in theory, after the menopause, endometriosis goes away and the pain goes away. But in practice, that isn't always the case. If the woman has very severe endometriosis and the tissues all stuck together and there's a lot of scarring that won't go away so some of the cyclical effects will go away but the pain etc that is caused by the tissues that are stuck and not mobile won't go away and obviously it depends if the woman takes hrt or not because if you take cyclical hrt then of course the symptoms can keep going as in the normal cycle so we tend to use continuous combined hrt as in you don't have a cycle like the normal cycle because that will aggravate endometriosis. So that's a sort of a, a brief overview. Lovely, thank you. So we've got masses more questions, but I want to, as I said earlier, give the last word to Carla. Carla, any thoughts that you'd like to share with our, our audience tonight? Thank you again. You've got an enormous number of dedicated followers in this audience who are very, mm -hmm. very complimentary about your bravery in dealing with your disease and also for being so public about it and for setting up these support groups and Facebook interfaces. So thank you again from all of us. But Carla, anything else you'd like to add as we draw this fascinating webinar to a close? Thank you. And yeah, I wanted to kind of comment on the diet um, side of things. So for me, diet changed my life, changing my diet. And I, I never kind of ate unhealthy, but I didn't realise how what types of foods and even just by drinking coffee um, would really flare my, my, me up, my symptoms and make things kind of exacerbate even, even more. So diet for me made a huge, huge difference and um, just kind of things like red meat, cutting out red meat and just lowering, you know, my intake on dairy and any, just following like an anti-inflammatory diet made such a difference for me and it really helped me. So I'm always encouraging people to, Kind of look into that and, and um, try and follow a, a, a better diet. <laughs> and obviously I, I think possibly the message here is you need to try out things one by one excluding one thing at a time so that you actually know what has helped or has not changed your symptoms so it's a very individual thing but thank you for that comment. Mm. Uh, it's past eight o'clock so I'll be ticked off if I don't stick to time and obey orders here. I want to thank everybody again very much indeed for coming tonight uh, to share their expertise and for the enthusiasm of our audience uh, that's particularly um, rewarding for us all. So I think what we've heard is that endometriosis is a really common problem. It's poorly investigated, it's poorly diagnosed, it's often inaccurately diagnosed or not diagnosed at all and missed. And what I get as well from the chat here and the questions that are being posed and my own personal experiences, so often it's too much too soon and then the other side is just too little too late. So I think it's been enormously helpful. Um, congratulations again to the King Edward VII multidisciplinary team for putting on this webinar. And um, if you like, shining a spotlight on such a common and debilitating problem. And I'd like to leave the audience now, just reminding them of the resources that are available on the King Edward VII website. 
www.kingedward7.co.uk um, and going on to the British Society of Gyne Gynecological Endoscopy website, the RCOG website and the NICE websites. And then also to encourage you to come back next week on Wednesday the 17th of March when we'll be having another endometriosis seminar um, again starting at 7 p.m. And on this occasion, we're going to be talking to some experts in other areas of medicine, colorectal, colorectal neurology and pain management teams who are going to deal with very severe endometriosis. So thank you again, everybody. Thank you particularly to Carla. Your contribution tonight has been really invaluable. And I know I'm speaking on behalf of the 157 or other uh, participants there were in the audience. So thank you. So good night to everybody. Thank you to the King Edward VII team for getting this up and running and for managing this webinar and inviting us all. And we look forward to interacting with you again next week. Thank you and good night. <laughs>